Bobby with Branding in Asia, and today we're sitting down with David Story. He is the principal for Asia Pacific at Design Studio. David, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Bobby. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. So you spent the past three years consulting across a number of industries. Um, what made you jump back into the agency life? It's a funny one. Um, the guys came and chatted to me a few years back and I've had much respect for Design Studio. And for about the last eight years, I've been watching, to a degree, with watching with Envy and recognizing that this business has done some incredible things over the last 12 years in terms of its operation, but more so that they've created the conditions for not only this business, but the client's businesses to actually grow through the power of creativity. And for me, that's not only admirable, uh, something I think that society needs far more of these days. Uh, and for me as well, I mean, the great thing about jumping back into this idea of essentially the world of agency is that now is an incredible time for us all to start to think about, well, how can we create work that actually has real impact? How do we step beyond just doing stuff for the sake of doing stuff? And for me, especially recognizing that, you know, whilst cliches are cliches, and I know in interviews, people love to use cliches that mm -hmm. ultimately it matters, you know, what the great brands these days are doing things that their customers, partners and society more broadly actually need, um, but more so they're taking action and they're doing, through, doing so through a sense of authenticity. Okay. Now um, you're running things for APAC, you're leading the growth for the agency. Um, previously, you said, uh, quote, we have an opportunity to do things differently in APAC as it's not bound by traditional branding codes. So when you could expand upon that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, this notion of codifying things is one that's spoken about a lot, but not necessarily understood these days. But in our Western world, we're often bound by a sense or a desire for simplification, uh, and especially in the way in which a brand is, presents itself. User interfaces, product design, it's constantly being stripped back, bare minimum. And what's happening is that's essentially whittling away the opportunity for fun, real emotions and vibrancy. And we're heading towards this same, same, but no difference world. But we're also seeing that happen within the West around the idea of this overly glossy, overly stylized, overly complicated brand image. I think that's happening due to a number of conflicting forces, you know, ease and speed and brands also retain a role in our lives, but not knowing how to. But what we see in APAC is new business models popping up left, right and center and new business models that you know, they are able to do so very, very quickly and do so due to scale and volume and recognize that microtransactions are driving a lot of the new tech startups that are happening within the field. But we're seeing that these brands are also creating new cues and creating their own approach to categories and they're not being dictated by it. Some of the work that we've recently done for ExpressVPN is a great example of that. And rather than leaning into the category conventions for VPNs and everything being terrified and uh, focusing on you know, men in cloaks and making sure that people right. don't feel, you know, you know, that they're going to have all their data stolen from them. Um, we focused on actually having this notion of shifting control, putting control back into the user's hands. And so we've ended up developing a brand system that gives them exactly that and hands over the power of their data and experiences online and developed a number of branding cues that have not been seen in the category space before, such as uh, beautiful gradients and motion gestures and the way in which the brand actually speaks to you rather than tries to scare you. Okay, that's interesting. Now, uh, you've also said, I mean, kind of expanding on that, you said uh, power, uh, design has the power to change the world. The world is in a very strange place right now. We have been for the past year and uh, while we're all hopeful, the, the near end in sight is not apparent at this point. Um, how has that changed during the pandemic in terms of creativity? Uh, and do you think what the changes that have happened during the pandemic will endure afterwards? Yeah, I think I'll just come back to this, the first part of the question, Bobby, about design having the power to change the world. And it's a very, um, you know, it's a statement that's loaded most definitely. And that's also because design is a loaded word. It's a verb and a noun. I think yeah. people often forget that the notion to design something, you know, to actually take action to do so. And I think that we as a species right now are starting to awaken to the way of life that whether knowingly or not, we'd actually designed and we designed it for ourselves and we've been caught in the confines of our design. 
So for me, you know, I hope that there'll be enduring changes that occur from this pandemic, and that you know, people will start to think about how they actually redesign their own lives and what matters most to them. And in doing so, we will come up with a new sense of what design sensibility means for our species. Um, that's interesting, uh, but kind of expanding on that uh, in terms of management. Uh, you're having a lot of uh, agencies that much of the staff is working at home. Have there been lessons that you've learned during this period of managing staff that are, you know, not nearby, not within the office? And do you think some of those changes are going to uh, continue to take place uh, after the pandemic is passed? Have the lessons that yeah. you've learned? Yeah. And Australia is in a very fortunate position right now. You know, my team is actually in office and has been in office for a number of months. We're all working with one another again. And we're seeing new modes of working occurring within Australia more broadly. Um, we're lucky and fortunate just due to the way in which our government has focused on shutting things down and managing the, the case numbers and load numbers. Um, but with that has also brought a number of changes that I think a number of countries, as they emerge from the pandemic, will start to see as well. You'll start to see the reappropriating of physical workspace and what the physical workspace is actually for and actually bringing people together. And that's one of the big things that we can see is missing from our other offices around the globe in that, that ability to actually physically connect with one another. And there's a degree of envy that occurs from you know, our London office and New York office and what we're doing in Sydney. But we all try to maintain a level of interaction and closeness and proximity to one another, regardless of our locations, due to you know, the likes of Slack and other digital products that allow us to interact far more in real time, but so too you know, things like Zoom and the meeting that we're having right now. Mm. Uh, you know, I kind of, it's a funny thing to think about those Cisco systems that you would wish would operate and work properly in all those meeting rooms so many years ago. And now it's just literally, it's commonplace and right. everybody has access to this incredible technology. And I think that technology will hopefully continue to act as an enabler for us to find what works best for us in terms of our working rhythms and styles. And that's where the interesting rub will be for people who've decided that actually working from home does work better for them versus those who need to be in the communal office space and they need to be around others because they get an energy from that. I think that comes down to introverted individuals, extroverted inter individuals. But the big change I think that needs to happen is inside workplaces themselves and the culture whereby that needs to shift to a sense of trust. And that's one of the new things that's been opened up and a new requirement for organisations is to place a new level of trust in their employees and vice versa. So that for me will be a great thing that hopefully comes out of this and we don't just snap back to, if I can't see you, then you must not be working. But here in Sydney, our team, if they want to work from home, they can work from home. We try to make sure that you know, we're cognizant of that within our own office space as well. I had never thought about it before, but I wonder how many agencies and businesses in general are having their holiday parties online. You know, we, we talk about, you know, having, you know, uh, business related meetings, taking care of the clients and then whatever projects and, that, and, and, and work that needs to be done. But I wonder how many of them are actually, you know, having the, the inner office parties online. I, I, that kind of yeah. bonding, I guess, is important. Yeah, most definitely. And during the pandemic, our team here in Sydney conducted um, trivia every couple of weeks so that they felt like they were connected to one another. And what we saw in our London office, Ben and Paul, our founders, co-founders, they made a point of actually getting in the car, driving around and visiting every single employee and dropping off a Christmas present to them just oh. to let them know. Obviously, you know, dropping it at the door and then walking back and allowing them to come out to pick it up. But making a point that our team matters and that we're here to care for them and look after them and that everybody is part of this business and design studio with a common goal of heading towards making a meaningful difference for our clients. Well, asking you uh, earlier whether any of these practices during the pandemic will continue, I don't imagine that many CEOs and managers will be playing Santa Claus next year. <laughs> that sounds like a lot of work going door to door. <laughs> yeah, it took them, it was over a number of days, almost weeks. And for me, that speaks volumes to this organisation. And it's, again, going back to one of your first questions, why I joined is because it's a founder-led business and it's run and owned by these two guys that, you know, they have spent 12 years toiling away, but they recognise that our industry is a people-based industry. We don't have widgets to sell. 
we've got people and making sure that your people are front and center of your strategy is of the utmost importance to design studio. Well, that's a good point. Um, speaking of the pandemic and the campaigns, uh, is, are there any particular campaigns you've seen that uh, have resonated with you during the COVID pandemic? Yeah, and uh, campaigns are a funny one, right? We, um, we saw every single brand come out and start to actually speak the same, sound the same. And that occurred almost within a four week period of one another. Yeah, I think and there was someone who actually made a video. I, I, I forget what it was called, but basically the, the COVID campaign. And it was like this generic campaign that, that many of the brands were doing, hitting all yeah. the check boxes. Yeah. Yeah. And my, my underlying theory of that or reason for that is that once it became global, every marketing team was grappling with the question how can we stay relevant quick? Let mm -hmm. everyone know that we care. We're here for you. We're in this together. And that was exactly the example that I was thinking about, Bobby. I, I watched that several times before jumping <laughs> onto this. Um, and there's good intention behind it, right? You can't shy away from that. You can't you know, shun the fact that these brands are trying to do something. They just haven't worked out how to actually connect. It's a strange um, new world. One, huh? It really is. It is, right? And one of them that did connect for me um, ironically, was in the campaign cut up that we've talked about was Apple. And, you know, it's a no surprise there. But the reason why was they were actually able to, through user generated content, and not necessarily the ones that were in that mashup, um, they demonstrated how products could actually bring people together in the way that only Apple can. Mm. For me personally, it hit an emotional cord that I needed um, and that I didn't really know that I needed at the time. Uh, but more close to the home, we were seeing brands actually taking action. I think, again, that comes down to the very fact that Australia, we had a fortunate situation and we saw these large behemoth supermarkets start to dedicate shopping hours to senior citizens and frontline workers and those who are more vulnerable. So going back to one of the things I was talking about earlier, brands that were demonstrating through action, not words, were the ones that resonated for me. Um, and it was more, it was far beyond just campaign work. It was more about tactical on the ground, what can we do to actually help our people? I mean, you're thinking about the likes of pret manger and the way in which all of a sudden their entire, in the UK, um, it's a sandwich, sandwich food chain and quick uh, service restaurant. Their foot traffic just dried up overnight and still has, but they created a subscription model out of nowhere and were mm -hmm. able to actually build this way of people essentially buying subscription lunches delivered to their homes. So I think that's a really interesting thing that's come out of this for organizations is how they've had to shift from focusing on communication to what can we do in terms of action. Oh, interesting. You, you, you said something that struck me that uh, the Apple campaign uh, hit an emotional cord with you that you didn't even realize that you needed. Um, and I, I, I haven't seen a lot about this. I don't know if we have to wait for the research to come through, but I'm curious about, you know, people, a lot of people are depressed. I mean, this is a very depressing time for all of us. Uh, my building was locked down. It was a complete mystery. I didn't know what, what was this COVID. We have a better grasp on what we're dealing with now, but there's so much uncertainty and, 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 and depression. And so I'm curious how that has affected consumer behavior um, in a more general basis of just, you know, the depression factor, the difficulty and the unknown factor that people are yeah. going through now. Most definitely, I think that that word in itself, there are two components to it. There's the emotional depression that we as uh, human beings are experiencing or have experienced, will experience. There's an economic depression. And those two things, to a degree, are going hand in hand for a number of countries. The economic standpoint, I mean, this is the wacky and crazy world that we live in. All economic models were essentially vaporized and uprooted by the pandemic. It, it was not this uh, W-shaped recovery we've been told in some countries. Instead, it was a massive V-shaped recovery. And we've seen central banks continue to print money so as to keep us all afloat. So you can see that sovereign nations are trying to ensure that the economic depression does not occur. And what that's also fueled is very strange consumer behavior. And it's manifests itself in very different ways. From panic buying of toilet paper, I don't know if that happened in Vietnam, but I know that it happened in the UK and Australia and in the States as well, to people spending big on homewares because they just simply needed to spend their money and they felt that they had to instead of going on an overseas holiday. Um, then to subscription businesses like that of Pret-a-Manger I mentioned, popping up literally overnight. 
But for me, I think you know, leaning into that first um, branch of what depression actually is and what it means in this current time, I think a softer side of what's going on is that we've seen this change in our working lives. We've been working from home far more. Mm. And in that, a renewed sense of actually what it means to be part of your local community, how to contribute in a way, it's, you know, becoming a more commonplace thing because ultimately it's a place that we're spending far more time. The flip side of that is we've and a lot of small to medium businesses that have been struggling and essentially gone under the world over. The number of four lease signs that I see walking around the streets of Sydney has grown exponentially over the last three months because a lot of that stimulus has started to drop off. And in all the face of this growth that I described in terms of that steep B for the economy, it really doesn't make sense. It's this incredible duality that's occurring in economic models. Um, and they've all been uprooted by the pandemic, as I said. And that, for me, is a big question that places, you know, uh, for brands in our lives, what it is that their role is and how they continue to take action. Okay. Um, last question. Um, as it's been well, uh, widely written about uh, the importance of data, um, and you, this, this. You, data has taken such great prominence. How, how do you reconcile, find a balance between creative design uh, with the data-driven uh, uh, you know, market research that, that clients come to expect? Yeah, it's a funny one. Uh, and you're seeing more and more and more and more and more data coming into the conversation now. Uh, patterns in usage, ways of engaging, where cohorts congregate, data can help and define and often change these um, consumer behaviours. But the way in which you interpret it is the most important and what you do with it is what matters most. For us, ensuring that you strike the balance between treating big data as another important input, but not the only input is incredibly important in the creative process and recognising what you can learn from those human behaviours and patterns but so too what you can't in terms of the interpretation and extrapolation of that data and the emotional quadrant that exists. We've all got emotions running through us. And I think for me, the moment we start to try and quantify the idea of love mm. is the moment that we've probably all lost as a species. It's quite a profound wrap up you got there. <laughs> I needed, I needed <laughs> something to wrap it up with, Bobby. <laughs> Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you and uh, all the best to you and yours there in Australia. Thank you. Likewise. Likewise.